All right, so let's start day two of terrible math lectures. So just so you're aware, I'm only teaching on Monday and today, so if you survive today, you never have to see me again, and you can go about the rest of your lives and ignore all of this. So just two more hours of me. So on Monday, we talked about matrix groups and about how they're useful, I mean, particularly for talking about rotations, but they're good for rotations, translations, any kind of rigid movement. I mean, they're useful for much more than just this. And we talked about, you know, you, you have these matrix groups, what a group even means, what a matrix thing even means, talking about manifolds, talking about, you know, how we can differentiate these things. And when you differentiate these things, you end up on the Lie algebra and all this garbledygook. Today, however, we're going to talk about how we can actually do geometry on these things. So if I give you the group, let's say SE or SO3, so the rotations, right, we can view this thing as a set in its own right, you know, this, the actual whatever this thing is, and we can actually talk about how we can do geometry on this stuff. So today we're going to do a Riemannian geometry, which is geometry of manifolds, which is actually if the underlying space is curvy. So to start with, geometry is just a branch of math concerned with points, lines, surfaces, solids, and other stuff. So this is according to uh, dictionary.com. But of course, this is a very vague and not very helpful definition. And of course, if you go back to the last slide, we're not talking about geometry, we're talking about Riemannian geometry. So there's going to be some specificness here. So the main thing before we get too into this is there are many, many, many different kinds of geometry that ask different questions and answer different answers. So we talk about, I'll talk about three real quick here, but there's, we're really only going to focus on one of them. So the first one is Finsler geometry, and Finsler geometry where, is where the only thing that you care about is measuring length. So if I give you a curve and the only thing you care about is how long this curve is, that's what Finsler tries to, to tackle. Riemannian geometry, on the other hand, deals with both length and angle. So what we're talking about today is if your underlying space is weird or curved or warped or whatever, you can define what it means for, for there to be a length to it, and you can also define what it means for there to be an angle. And then the last one is symplectic geometry, and symplectic geometry now deals with areas, is its fundamental thing. So if you guys have seen Lagrangian mechanics before, that's entirely Riemannian geometry. Have you guys seen Hamiltonian mechanics before? That's entirely symplectic geometry. So you've seen these things before in a, in a very backward background thing. So um, we're going to try to introduce Riemannian geometry as easy as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to first just define what angle and length is according to our own notions before we make things weird. So suppose we have two curves, and let's just say these two curves live in R2. These are just the plane, so nothing scary is going on. So we have gamma 1 and gamma 2. And suppose they cross here at 0. What is the angle there? How do we compute the angle of two curves? What do we do? Take the dot product of the, well, that's not quite the right answer, right? That's pretty close. Right? What you do is you draw the tangent lines at each of these things, right? and you can compute the angle between the tangent lines, which is essentially the dot product. But, you, but the actual formula for the angle right is this thing. So what you do right is you differentiate both curves, you take the dot product, and then you normalize it by their lengths, and then you take the cosine. It's the true thing, right? So the thing to keep in mind here is the way that you find, define an angle between two curves is where you've got to differentiate the curves. You've got to use a dot product somehow, and you've got to use a norm somehow. So we're kind of seeing the underlying things we need to be paying attention to are dot products and norms. And the next thing we're going to talk about is length, of course. So if we have a curve that just goes from 0 to 1, how long is this curve? Well, not one. It's what, I, mean, this can be, I mean, what I'm looking for is some kind of formula like this, right? So the dot product of the derivatives is essentially the angle. What idea makes the length of a curve? Hmm? Yeah, so that's pretty close. So the length of the curve is, well, you just take... Um, the velocity, right, so the tangent vector at each point, you figure out how long it is and you integrate these. So if you integrate the derivative lengths, that gives you the length of the overall curve, okay? So to understand what it means to be an angle of a curve or to be the length of a curve, we need a notion of dot products and a notion of norms, okay? So everything boils down to dot products and norms. 
So really that's what Riemannian geometry studies. So, but of course we say dot products and norms, but as everyone hopefully should at least be kind of aware of, um, the norm is just given by the dot product, right? So when we say dot products and norms, really everything just boils down to the dot product. So if you give me a dot product, I can tell you what angles mean and I can tell you how long things are. So this whole quest of Ramanian geometry is entirely just gonna be understanding what a dot product is. But it's gonna be scarier than that, but essentially it's gonna be just understanding what a dot product is. Right here. And likewise, since Finsler geometry um, only deals with lengths, it doesn't care about angles. If you try to get into Finsler geometry, you only care about norms, you no longer care about dot products, but I don't really know anything about this and we don't really care about this. But if you wanna Google it, there's a whole thousand books you can read on this topic if it intrigues you. Okay, so if we have two vectors in Rn, so two just column vectors, right, we can define the dot product as the usual sense by just taking the transpose and then multiplying them together, right? But of course we can be a little bit spice here with this, we can do a little bit more generality than just doing a transpose. And when we make it a little bit more general, we call it an inner product, and a word of warning, I will use inner product and dot product interchangeably throughout this lecture, so if I say one, they really mean the same thing, okay? It's just a way to multiply two vectors together. So, if we just start off with a normal vector space, so you can just think of Rn and column vectors, there's no reason to get too general here. Anything that takes in two vectors and spits out a number is an inner product, and there are three rules you need to follow. Does anyone know what the three rules are that makes an inner product an inner product, or that makes a dot product special? Well, that's, that, that's depending on it being an Rn. In Rn, every vector has to have n elements in them. And, that's two. That falls under positive definite for, for Rn purposes here. So it's gotta be bilinear, positive definite, and that follows for free, actually, from the, the, the norm. Sorry, what? This one. So the first thing is gotta be symmetric, right? If you change the order of the dot product, nothing changes. And the way you can think about this, right, is the dot product's kind of the angle, so the angle between A and B and the angle between B and A are the same angle. Okay, so when you flip the orders of the dot product, nothing changes. It's gotta be linear. So if alpha and beta are just real numbers, you can break this thing apart this way. And of course you get bilinear from this because you get linear in the first, but then you can flip it and you can get linear in the second. And then the last one is you gotta have positive definite. So this just basically says that the only vector that has length zero is a zero vector, nothing else goes to zero. So anything that follows these three rules is gonna be called an inner product or you know, I might slip up and call it a dot product. It doesn't have to be the transpose rule. So the question that immediately should come to mind is we know that U transpose V follows these three rules, but how much does this fail in the other direction? If we just require these three rules, how much more exciting of dot products can we cook up? And the answer is we can get more exciting, but not too terribly much so. So let's consider this matrix. So it's just a two by two matrix. We're acting on R2, just two vectors. Um, Notice that if you define the dot product this way, so if we just jam this matrix in between the two, this is still gonna give us an inner product, okay? So I'm not really gonna explain why too much, but I challenge you to play around with it, and we'll see a little bit later why this is true, okay? So um, basically what, what turns out to be is every inner product has the form where you can just stick some unknown matrix in the middle. But of course, there's a little bit of a fine print on what kind of matrices work for this, because of course, if your matrix is just a zero matrix, then when you plug this in, you're always gonna get to zero and that's a pretty stupid dot product to work with. So we have this, and of course this is gonna change the notion of geometry in this following sense. So here what we have is this is the normal metric, so this is just using the normal dot product. This shows us two uh, unit orthogonal vectors to each other according to the way that you should see things. But if we use the metric on the last page with the weird matrix, the, the two set of vectors over there, now those are orthonormal. Okay, so orthonormal still makes sense, it just doesn't mean what you think it means. So the effect of changing this matrix, opposed, so, so sticking this matrix inside this product goes along with basically shearing 
and rotating and, and transforming this. So it's still a perfectly valid geometry to work with. It's just kind of you're drunk and you're looking at it. Okay, and of course you can make up any of these such matrices and the geometry you end up with is perfectly valid. It just feels odd and it looks a little bit weird. So we can do a little bit of a demonstration to show a little bit more. So if we, right, we have, of course, if you choose two orthogonal vectors, you can rotate them around however you feel like it, right? So no matter what, right, the blue vector and the red vector are always orthogonal unit vectors to each other, and we can rotate them as we feel fit. But if we use this funky metric where we stick this matrix M in, we on the other hand get this thing. Okay, so at every single point, the blue vector and the red vector both have length one and they're both orthogonal to each other, but it's with respect to a weird dot product. Okay, so of course you can make up whatever dot product you want and you can make up any kinds of geometries you want like this and all the rules of geometry are still gonna follow verbatim. It's just a little bit odd, okay? But they're fun to look at at the very least. All right. So, the question as to what matrices work, well, it works if the matrix is symmetric and positive definite. So any symmetric positive definite matrix gives you an inner product and any inner product comes from jamming in a positive definite, symmet positive definite symmetric matrix. So as you see from back here, the reason why this matrix works is because, well, it's symmetric and it's also positive definite if you compute it. So the no amount of different kinds of geometries you can stick on Rn is equal to the amount of different kinds of positive definite symmetric matrices you can use. And they're all gonna give you valid geometries, but they're all gonna be sheared or twisted or warped in some sense or one another. But um, there's a little bit, physicists don't really like this a whole lot. So we require everything to be positive definite, but there can be times where you just require it to be non-degenerate, so your, your, your matrix can be negative definite if you want. And this comes up in called, what's called Lorentzian geometry, which is using special relativity which we're not gonna get anywhere near, so don't freak out about this. But some people do care about things that aren't positive definites. So you can have dot products to give you negative answers, but we're not gonna deal with that at all. So what we've seen is if we're given an inner product or a dot product, we can use that to define what an angle means and what a length of a curve means. But likewise, from the past theorem, um, a dot product or an inner product is synonymous with the positive definite symmetric matrix we stick inside it. So the moral of the story is a positive definite symmetric matrix gives you your geometry. So asking questions about geometry is synonymous with just picking a matrix. So if you've seen any themes between Monday and today, it really should just be that everything is matrices. You're never gonna escape them. So we're gonna use matrices to define the geometry of matrices, and it's gonna get a little matrix heavy, but just bear with me. It's just gonna be lots of matrices. So the rest of the, this class is basically gonna be examining matrices and seeing what kind of geometries we can pop up with, with these types of matrices. So the reason where Riemannian geometry really comes into play is we can use manifolds. We can actually examine geometry on manifolds, and in geometry on a manifold are things that aren't flat. So we can actually talk about you know, how long a curve is on the sphere, how long a curve is on a donut, what the angle between two things are, and such and such, right? So if you wanna fly from here to London, right, you're not really going in a straight line because the Earth is curved, so how to actually figure out what that curve is all falls under this realm. And basically how this gets encapsulated is before if we just use, let's say, this matrix everywhere, it's gonna be some sort of shared reality, but it's still gonna be flat. The way curvature comes in is now where the matrices are allowed to change where we move. So where things are gonna get hard as we move around our points, our matrices are gonna change. And as the matrices change, that's gonna actually make things exciting for us. But if you also go back to the very beginning of this lecture, nothing, so if we had our curve gamma and we were curious about the angles and the lengths of it, we never once actually cared about gamma. We always cared about the derivative of gamma. If you want the, the angle between two curves, you look at the angle between their tangent lines. If you want to figure out how long a curve is, you integrate the length of its tangent, right? So as such, we're really only gonna be interested in gamma dot and not gamma. So going back to Monday, if we're only interested in derivatives of curves and not the curves themselves, what objects are we gonna be interested in? 
close, a little bit more general than the algebras. No. These are all examples. Starts with a T, ends with an angent space. Tangent space, right? So we talked about tangent spaces a little bit on Monday. We have to talk about tangent spaces a little bit more today because that's what we're measuring from. So for these reasons, right, we're going to revisit manifolds and we also have to put a lot of emphasis on tangent spaces because understanding the tangent spaces is actually going to tell you the information you need about lengths and about angles. The manifold itself really doesn't matter a whole lot. So this is probably going to be the scariest slide of today. If you can get through this, I'm proud of you. So on Monday, we said a manifold is anything that locally looks flat. So the Earth is a manifold because where we're standing right now, the Earth looks like a plane, right? A circle is a manifold because if you zoom in enough on the circle, the circle looks like a line and so on and so forth. But that is a painfully vague definition. So this is the formal definition. So now everyone knows the formal definition of a manifold. But let's just break this down before you, know, you just pass out on me here. This first line just says we have our manifold M and we can just chop it up into pieces. So basically what's going to mean is each of these pieces we can flatten out and it's going to look flat. So this is the earth. This is each one of these pieces are where each of us are standing and they all look like a plane. The second line just says there's a function that maps this chopped up piece into flat space such that this is the smoothing out procedure. Okay, so we're chopping it up. We're smoothing out each piece. And this condition right here takes a lot of staring at to figure out what's going on. But this basically says if you, do a, if, if you look at the overlap between the pieces that you chop up and you switch between which overlap piece you're on, everything stays smooth. So there's a picture on the next slide that might make this a little bit clearer, hopefully. So basically the simplest manifold we can think of is a circle. Well, okay, the simplest manifold we can think of is a line because a line is just a line. And if it looks like a line, it is a line, right? But we can make this a little bit more instructive for what's going on in the last piece. So we have our circle. We chop it up into the four pieces, the red, green, yellow, and blue. So each of these are our U alphas. This is like U1, U2, U3, and U4 when we go back. Sorry, so condition one, the U alphas are just the four different colors of these line segments. Then, of course, each of these line segments we can flatten out into an actual line. And so if this green curve right here is U1, this map right here mapping it to this line segment is called phi1. Okay, and then so this is the actual line segment. And then the third condition basically just says, well, we, if we're on this overlap, right, we can either go to the blue line or to the red line. So likewise, if we're right here on this red line, we, get, we go to this part of the circle, and then we can go from this part of the circle to this part of the blue line, right? So if we define the function here that takes us from this bit to this bit, that function is going to be differentiable, is all that it's saying. So that's by far the most technical piece, but it's useful because we want to take derivatives of things. And that last case just allows us that derivatives work nicely. So you're never going to have to really deal with this definition, but it's at least a good thing to kind of know what's going on. But at the end of the day, you can just remember it's something that if you zoom in enough, it's flat. And again, we want to be differentiable, so there's no corners as well. So we don't want to deal with a square because a derivative on a corner with a square is going to get us into a little bit of a trouble. Questions about this so far? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so when I say the word smooth, smooth means it's infinitely differentiable. We're, just, we're not going to deal with any kind of, it's not continuous. Everything's going to be continuous. Everything's going to have derivatives. We're not going to try that hard. Because you can do a lot of this. If you, if you relax those, it just becomes a lot more work and we're, we're lazy. So everything is differentiable. All right. So basically anything that you can imagine, right, is an example of a manifold. So for example, if you just use Euclidean space, if you just use Rn, of course Rn looks like Rn because it is Rn, so that's a manifold. You don't have to do any kind of work. Um, the sphere, as we said, is a manifold because of course the Earth, if you're standing on it, looks like a plane. Um, and the same thing with the torus. So the donut is also a manifold, right, because if you zoom in enough on the surface of a donut, that's going to be flat. Um, and a fun fact, right, is the torus is the configuration space for the double pendulum. So the double pendulum, you can view that as, as living on this manifold if you want to think of it that way. 
So there's this very, very nice theorem, and this theorem basically says that anything you can possibly conceive of is going to be a manifold, because manifolds shouldn't be too scary, everything is one. And basically, let's say you have a function from R and into R, um, then every level set of that is going to be a manifold, so long as derivatives don't go silly, right? So given any function, so long as the gradient is non-zero, all of the level sets are going to be manifolds. So basically, if you have a thing and you don't know if it's a manifold, well, if you can describe it as a level set of some function, so long as the function's reasonably nice, you're going to automatically have a manifold, okay? So really, anything you can think of that's not incredibly stupid falls under this, this, this category. So an example of this, we can formally prove that a sphere is a manifold because we can write the sphere as a level set of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The gradient of this doesn't vanish, therefore its level set has to be a manifold, which is of course just a three sphere. So this is, you know, a formal proof that the sphere is a manifold, but of course we kind of already had intuition on it beforehand. So again, anything you can think of within reason falls under this category, and in particular all of the matrix groups we dealt with yesterday fall under this category as well. A point is a zero-dimensional manifold, and I don't know anyone who takes them seriously. You just call them a point, but I guess you can count as it as being a manifold. Yeah, you can give a point a topological structure, right? Yeah, so I guess it would count. All right, so questions are all about manifolds. Or just anything that locally looks flat, yeah. Manifold is something that looks flat when you zoom in enough. So right, with these examples here, right, the, the Earth is not flat, but if where we're standing, the Earth looks flat to us. It's like if you have a function back in Calc 1, a function is differentiable. If you zoom in enough on it, it looks like a straight line. So by a function being differentiable, that says that the graph of the function is a manifold. It can be anything that's, the only rule is no corners. Because a corner, you can't take a derivative along a corner, but flat or, or curvy, anything is allowed. The only rule is you zoom in enough, it looks flat. All right, any other questions? Yeah, so basically, if your gradient can equal zero, you can have like weird degeneracy things, and you can have weird silly things where like, um, your manifold, trying to figure out how to, like, right, this disk is a manifold, right, because it locally looks flat. But you could have something like a disk with a hair on it, and this technically isn't a manifold, because this is two-dimensional and this is one-dimensional, and they don't agree, and you can have weird things like this can happen if the derivative is allowed to vanish on your level set. And you can also have strange things where you can like get cusps and things to occur. So if the gradient is zero, it's not always a, always a death sentence, but if the gradient is non-zero, you're always fine. But again, you can just use inspection just to make sure something stupid doesn't happen. I've, I mean, in practice, I've never seen anything stupid happen, so. Anything else? All right. So the next point we need is that of the tangent space. So I tried drawing this yesterday, but I think this is a better picture than I could draw. So right, what's going on is you have your underlying manifold, which is some kind of curvy thing, right? You're given some sort of a curve gamma on it, and then the derivative of the curve, this is going to be a tangent vector, and all possible tangent vectors form the tangent space. So what we saw in the beginning of class is to measure, let's say, the angle between two curves, you differentiate both curves. These are going to give you vectors on the tangent space, and then now you want to compute the dot product on the tangent space. So really, when we're doing this geometry, we're really interested in this tangent plane, tangent space. We're not so much as interested in what's going on down here, okay? And again, right, every possible derivative you can get from taking all of these possible curves is going to give you the whole tangent space. Yeah. Well, also, if you make, if you go, if you have the same curve but you go along it faster, that's going to give you a longer tangent vector. So you want to go rotations and speeds to get everything possible, because you can fill out the entire plane with tangent vectors. If you just rotate, that's just going to trace out a circle. And again, if you're not moving, if your if your trajectory is not moving at all, your tangent vector is just going to be like the zero vector. So you can get everything you want.
All right. So if we choose a point x in our manifold, the thing t sub x of m just means the tangent space at m is what we call it. And as we discussed yesterday, um, t x of m is going to always be a vector space. So you can always view the tangent space as r n, which has a severe, um, it's, it's severely better than the manifold, right? Because the manifold, you, you can only say it looks like Rn. It's not actually Rn. It's something curvy. But the tangent space always is Rn. The tangent space always is Euclidean. The tangent space is always nice to work with. And the dimension of the tangent space and the dimension of the manifold always agree with each other. OK? So if you know what's going on with the manifold, so if you know the manifold's three-dimensional, you know the tangent space has to be three-dimensional and vice versa. And, but you always do get an addition that the tangent space is always a vector space. Questions? All right. So going a little bit back to Monday, right, if we have a Lie group, so when I say Lie group, just think matrix group, and when I say matrix group, just think SO3 or SE3. Um, and if you choose the identity element, so just the identity matrix, right, then the Lie algebra is going to be given by the tangent space at the identity. So in particular, if our group is the special orthogonal group, so just the rotation matrices, then the Lie algebra is given by just the skew symmetric matrices, right? And is right. So th this is always going to be a vector space. So if you take two skew matrices and you add them together, you're going to get a new skew matrix. And the dimension of this is going to equal the dimension of the underlying um, Lie group as well. So we didn't talk about this on Monday. So, but the only real Lie algebra we talked about was the special orthogonal one. Does anyone know what the Lie algebra for the special Euclidean group is? Okay, I'll take that as a no. So, right, so how did we figure out um, what what this, how did we determine what this thing was on Monday? We did a simple computation, well, simple enough computation to compute this. And remember, we used the fact that for SON, these are matrices such that A, A transpose equals the identity, right? And then what we did is we differentiated this thing. And when we differentiated it, this popped out the fact so let's say if we have from these three lines, right? So what we did is we had our curve that has to always be a rotation matrix, right? We differentiated that by use of the product rule. And then we used the fact that at zero, this and this have to be the identity. And then what we end up with is that the derivative at zero has to be a skew matrix, okay? So we can use this exact same idea for the special Euclidean group. And remember, the special Euclidean group let I guess, do n. It can be more general. There. OK. That's actually a reasonably good question. I'll get back to that after I do this computation. But there's a little bit more subtext to that. So the special Euclidean group. Um, are matrices that look like this. So when we differentiate this, right, what type of objects do you think we're going to get? Well, three of these should be quite easy, right? When you take the derivative of zero, what's the derivative of zero? Zero. What's the derivative of one? Zero. What's the derivative of r? Something skew, right? Now, what's the derivative of p? Well, 
Well, in this example right here, right, what does R represent in the special Euclidean group? Well, like physically, what's going on? It's a rotation, right? What is P? It's a translation, right? So when you differentiate a rotation, you get something skew. If you differentiate a translation, what do you get? You get a, well, well, so like, you know, if I throw a marker, right, it ends up over there, and you differentiate it, it's gonna be a vector pointing in that direction, right? So it's still gonna be a vector. If the, if the marker lands all the way over there, it's a vector, but when it starts and it differentiates, it's still gonna be a vector. So it's gonna end up happening when we differentiate this, we're still gonna get a vector back, right? And another way you can think about it, I had the marker though. <laughs> Is you can also think that you have the curve, you can like gamma of t, well, let's say R of T, right, whatever the rotation matrix trajectory is. But then you can just say, um, let's say V times T, right? Because the point is, this thing, this thing always has to be a, a rotation matrix. This thing always just has to be a vector. So of course this thing is gonna be a vector. And when you differentiate V times T, what do you end up with? V, which again is another vector, right? So you differentiate this component, nothing really happens, right? Differentiating this is gonna become skew, but this is pretty boring. So the Lie algebra for the Euclidean group is gonna be, um, let's say, omega V is just gonna be given by this. So if you're thoroughly confused about how to do these computations, just memorize these two, and I don't think you're gonna have to know any the other ones for this class. But the moral of the story is the orthogonal group gives you skew things, the special Euclidean gives you skew and translation. But again, this translation is really like a translational velocity, not truly a translation. So. One other question that I kind of want to get to is if we have O-N and S-O-N, right, does the Lie algebras equal? And likewise, if we have um, E-N, so for the, the non-special Euclidean group, does this equal the Lie algebra for the special Euclidean group? Does the special add anything on the Lie algebra level? It definitely adds things to the group levels, because remember what we talked about, um, the difference between these two things is this thing has reflections and this thing's not allowed to have reflections, right? But in terms of the actual algebras, does it matter if you, if you throw out the S or not? Yeah, but yeah, so these two are not the same. But are these two the same? Are the Lie algebras the same? So who thinks he, they are the same? Who thinks they're not the same? Who's not raising their hand because they're bored? So it turns out they are the same, and let's explain why they're the same. And let's only let's let's be very lazy and only deal with um SO2 slash O2. So in terms of geometry, right, what is the matrix group SO2? Yeah, but specifically on the plane, right? So how can you rotate on a plane? Just clockwise or counterclockwise, right? Right, so the point is, SO2 just equals a circle, right? The angle on the circle tells you how much you rotate. If you go counterclockwise, it's gonna be an angle going counterclockwise. If you go in clockwise, it's gonna be an angle clockwise, right? What is O2? Well, 
Well, clearly O2 contains SO2, right? So it contains a circle, but it's not just a circle, it's two circles. Why is it two circles? This is the reflection circle, this is the non-reflection circle, right? This circle means you rotate by this angle, this circle means you mirror first and then you rotate by this angle, okay? It going off of these pictures, right, let's say that this is the identity element and this is the identity element. So the Lie algebra for SO2 is this line and the Lie algebra for O2 is also this line. So in terms of finding the tangent space of the identity, you completely ignore this circle because this circle doesn't have the identity, so you don't care about this. So this is a completely separate thing that doesn't interfere with you at all. So we know that these two things have to be equal. So in terms of taking the algebras, it doesn't matter if you do SON or just ON or SEN or just EN, okay? Because you're only looking at what's happening at the identity and the identity is the same for both, yeah? So SE2, did my computer actually die? Give me a second, I'll answer your question. Okay, so SE2 is a little bit scarier and the answer is you can't really draw it, you kind, you kind of can. So I will draw it over here because we have room. So SE2, right, this is a rotation and a translation, right? But again, as we saw over there, the rotation is just gonna be given by a circle. What are the translations given by? This is the plane, right? Any point on the plane you can translate to that point. So this is gonna be a plane. Okay, well the filled in plane is not a box. So how do we combine these two notions together? So this is where you can't really draw things on the blackboard, but what the idea is, is you wanna do like essentially the Cartesian product between these two sets and what you're gonna have is you're gonna have the, the, the infinite plane and at each point on it, there's gonna be a circle. And you look at how, however you're supposed to picture this together, but you have a plane and every single point on the plane has a circle glued to it. So you, you can't draw it. It's some like weird like smeared out cylinder thing. But you can also think of it as just a plane in a circle holding hands, if you wanna think of it that way. I don't have a better answer. And again, then just E2, as opposed to SE2, is gonna be a plane holding hand of two circles. Yes. Yes. All right. So questions about any of this? All right. So this, again, we're gonna do a little bit more recap. So this was all just the algebra, which is what happens when you differentiate the identity. But again, if you differentiate not at the identity, what happens? Well, remember, if you just have the curve, the exponential of AT, right? At zero, this thing's gonna be the identity. And when you differentiate it, the A is gonna pop out and you can get A. Likewise, though, if we put a G in front of it, right? At zero, this curve's gonna be at G and the derivative at zero is just gonna be g times a. So if you are working not at the identity, all that happens is you just pre-multiply everything by a g. So if you wanna look at the tangent space of the orthogonal group not at the identity, you just take a skew matrix and multiply it on the left by something that's, ortho or that's the orthogonal matrix you're in. So it looks a little bit different, but all that's going on is you just take your Lie algebra and you're just multiplying it on the left by another matrix and that's all that has to go through. So if you know what's happening at the identity, you automatically know what's going on everywhere, okay? So a skew matrix is in the Lie algebra, but a rotation matrix times a skew matrix is always gonna live in some different kind of tangent space. So with this formula then, what is the tangent space of the special Euclidean group somewhere else? Well, 
Well, it turns out actually it's a little, it's a lot a bit nicer. So if we're in the special Euclidean group now, our group element is going to be a rotation element, a rotation matrix, and some sort of a translation vector. Or if we want to view this in the homogeneous coordinates, right, we can view it. It really doesn't matter, right? And likewise, if we had something in the Lie algebra, so let's call it uh, C, this thing is going to be equal to some skew thing, some vector, and then zeros and zeros. Okay? So what happens when you multiply these two matrices together? Well, when you multiply these two matrices together, this is going to give you something in the more general tangent space, and what you end up with is R P zero one omega V zero zero equals So the interesting thing that happens here is the p disappears, and what you end up with, well, this thing is something that's in the new, in, in the new tangent space on just the orthogonal group, and this thing, again, is just going to be a 3 by 3 vector. So um, forms, so this is going to be inside the tangent space at the point rp in se, uh, let's say 3. Okay, so a general element in the special Euclidean Lie algebra looks like this, and an arbitrary element in the um, special orthogonal Lie algebra looks like this. And again, you can do this for all sorts of other groups, but these are really going to be the only two that you have to care about. So again, if you're confused about how we did this, just write down the answers and move on with your life. All right, so now we can actually get to what Ramanian geometry is. So the actual point of Ramanian geometry is it's a pair, and this is where notation is going to get a little bit silly. Um, here, normally what you call your metric is you normally call your metric G, which gets confusing because we call our group elements G, so there's just not enough letters in the alphabet. But what a Ramanian metric is, is it gives you a dot product on each tangent space. So we have our manifold. Our manifold is made up of all these different tangent spaces. We can do it. Each tangent space, we endow it with a dot product. And with this idea, this means any curve we have, I mean, we differentiate it, its derivatives are going to lie in different tangent spaces. But we can still compute their norms on each tangent space and then integrate that across and get the, the length. And same thing with the, with the angles. Right? We find the point where they cross. We compute on the tangent space where they can cross. And then we can compute the angles there. So all this really is, is you can think of this as like a varying dot product. And as we see down here, right, an inner product is synonymous with this positive definite symmetric matrix. And up here, it just says that at each point we have a metric. So really, all Ramanian geometry is, is every point on your manifold gives you a matrix, and that matrix at that point gives you the dot product. So really, it's an infinite family of dot products or an infinite family of matrices. But the important thing is, is now the matrices can change. Okay? And this is where things are going to start getting really weird. So before we move on, is everyone at least reasonably okay with the, with the reasoning behind this definition at least? So like down here? So this just says the, the inner product is given by a matrix, right? And this inner product depends upon the point. So really what this is saying is you choose your manifold, each point in the manifold corresponds to a matrix, which gives you this. So the, the, the idea of studying inner products is the same thing as studying matrices. So you're just looking at like matrix valued functions on a manifold is the same thing as looking at geometry on the manifold. There's no groups, we're not looking at any kind of group structure right here, this is completely arbitrary. So let's try to do an example because this is a lot of garbledy gook. So let's consider the sphere, um, which is the easiest, not easy manifold. And again, let's just choose coordinates, uh, theta and phi, where theta is the inclination, 
and phi, or phi is the azimuth, so it's basically latitude and longitude, okay? This picture I saw off of Wikipedia, and it also says R, because this is for spherical coordinates, bar just equals one, we're gonna ignore that. So the interesting thing here is now at each point in our manifold right on the sphere is gonna be given by phi and theta for latitude and longitude, and this is what the mass, not the mass matrix, sorry, this is what the um, dot product matrix is. So if you look at this thing, is this thing symmetric and positive definite? It's definitely symmetric, is it positive definite? Yeah, right, because one is, well, one, and sine squared is always gonna be positive, so everything is fine here. The interesting thing to note is this matrix now changes depending upon where on the sphere we are. And there are two points on the sphere where things go drastically terrible, and where, where is that and why is that? Well, what's zero and what's pi? And when theta is zero and theta is pi, right, this thing's gonna be zero, right? And if this matrix has a zero entry here, it's no longer gonna be symmetric and positive definite. But what points on the sphere correspond to theta being zero? The North Pole and the South Pole, right? So basically what this is saying is on the North Pole and the South Pole, things fall apart. And that's kind of unavoidable. When you do things with manifolds, what's gonna happen normally is when you get to the end of these regions, you end up dividing by zero and bad things happen. That's just a fact. So this really just means you can't be at the poles. But this thing varies. So what we see is, right, this is the picture of the Earth under this phi and theta coordinates. And as we see, right, when we get closer to the North Pole and closer to the South Pole, things fall apart, right? In particular, at the South Pole, right, the South Pole, which is just a singular point in real life, is smeared out to a whole line. And that's clearly something stupid is happening. And same thing at the North Pole. And the closer we get to the South Pole and the closer we get to the North Pole, the more things fall apart. But we have a very quantifiable way to say that, right, because everything's encoded in this matrix. And this matrix becoming singular completely determines why the Mercator projection is a terrible projection. So we can actually quantify this a little bit. So what this picture shows is this shows the coordinates for phi and theta between zero and two pi and zero and pi. And what this is here, so this is gonna be at pi and pi over two. Um, this gives us a set of orthogonal unit vectors on the sphere. But as we move, right, the matrix changes and the concept of orthogonal vectors or normal vectors changes too. So each of these points, they're orthogonal unit vectors, but as the point moves, what it means to be an orthogonal unit vector changes as well. And as we move down to the south pole, what is happening to the blue line? It's blowing up, right? It's going to infinity, right? And the fact that that's going to infinity is exactly explaining why the south pole is getting smeared out to infinity. It's the same thing that this tangent vector is gonna get smeared out to infinity as well. So all Ramanian geometry really is getting at is you have these things, but now not only is your concept of what an orthogonal unit vector is by change, but it depends upon where you are and it changes as it goes around. And as these things change as you move around describes the fact that the Earth is a sphere, right? So the Earth is a sphere, which is an example of something called positively curved. There's also something called negatively curved. And does anyone know who made this drawing artwork? Who's the artist? No. Who drew this? Point Grey did the math for this, but he wasn't the artist. It's a famous, it's a famous artist. Escher, Escher did this. This is an Escher picture. So this is what's called hyperbolic geometry, which you might have heard of hyperbolic geometry, I don't know. There's also what's called negatively curved. Um, and as you look at here, this is a kind of grainy picture, but again, just Google Point Grey disk, Google Escher, you can find all sorts of these things. What happens is you have this square right here. This square is the same size as, wait, I'm getting lost here. So I think this square, and then this square is the same size as this square. So what ends up happening is the horizon is infinitely far away from us, and everything's getting infinitely squished out into the horizon. So again, if you Google this, you can find GIFs of it where people move around on it, and it's very trippy, and lines flip all over the place. Um, but what we have, though, is we do get that this is now the matrix that defines the inner product. So what happens on this picture back here, the boundary is given by the unit circle. So we have to lie inside the unit circle because the unit circle is infinitely far away. 
and this is the metric we have. So this is the matrix. So again, we're inside the circle. And what happens when you reach the circle? What happens to the matrix? It goes to infinity, right? And the fact that the matrix falls apart when we get to the circle encodes the fact that the manifold kind of falls apart when we get to the circle. In the same way that with the map projection, the fact that the matrix fell apart at the poles showed that the, the, the picture fell apart at the poles. So the same thing goes here. So using this metric defines you this geometry. Um, and this is a new picture that we get. So here again, we have orthogonal unit vectors on the circle. And what happens is we move closer and closer to the boundary, these things shrink up quite fiercely. And what ends up happening is you zoom in closer and closer to the boundary, these things are gonna keep getting smaller and smaller and you can never actually reach it. All right, any question on these two geometries? These are just two arbitrary examples because you can draw pictures quite easily. But the moral of the story is everything revolves around this matrix. If you give me this matrix, I can draw you pictures like this and we can talk about geometry. And discussing how you come up with these matrices, that's a little bit complicated of a task that I'm probably going to let Mani teach you or you're just going to never learn. But for now, it's just everything is given the matrix, you can do lots of wonderful things. But of course, you can kind of do this a little bit brute force when you're on a Lie group now. So returning to a Lie group, um, recall right, that the tangent space at a non-identity element is the same thing as just multiplying the Lie algebra by this element. So therefore, we can define the dot product since the, the dot product at a point right, is going to be given by the same point times the Lie algebra elements. We can just completely just close our eyes to all of the Gs. And if you define a metric on your Lie group such that it really doesn't depend upon where you are, everything just cancels out, this is called left invariant. So there's a paper by Monty and I that he might talk about, it's like point cloud registration garbage, something about lining up pictures. And the way we do that is we use a left invariant metric on this Lie group can be used for image registration. Um, so you'll probably see that later in this course, but this is a very easy way that you can just build metrics on Lie groups, because if you just build a metric on the Lie algebra and fix that, then you're good for the rest of the group. Which is what this is. So an example of this is if we use the special orthogonal group, right, then the Lie algebra are gonna be skew symmetric matrices. So the average element in the Lie algebra looks something like this. And remember, we talked about a little bit on Monday, this is the same thing as just calling it a three vector. We can just organize it this way. So what we're gonna do is we can define a dot product on this Lie algebra by just taking the dot product of their corresponding vectors. And it normally, 99% of the time when people do um, metrics on SO3, they just use this normal like dot product one. And you can do this and this can give you a geometry on the special orthogonal group and you can go about your day with this. So, because a lot of times it doesn't really matter what the metric is, you just need one to roll with for what we're gonna do next. So, before we move on, are there any more questions? Okay. So, we've talked about this geometry, but we wanna actually be able to compute useful things with this. I mean, so far this is cool for drawing pictures and kind of knowing what's going on, but you know, we're engineers, we have to solve something to make it look like we're busy. So a very wonderful thing about Ramanian geometry is this is actually the machinery that's behind gradient descent or gradient ascent, okay? So let's say we have some sort of a function, let's say it's on our manifold. So a, a, a candidate function would be, we have a function on our special orthogonal group so on our rotations, and let's say we wanna find a rotation that maximizes energy or whatever, right? So in order to find out what, how to maximize this function, it means we wanna find an element of our matrix group that maximizes this thing. And in general, that's very, very hard to do. So the essence, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to switch to using gradient ascent, which is gonna turn this into an ODE problem, right? And gradient ascent just says we follow this ODE which just means that we go in the direction where it's increasing the fastest, right? Because everyone should be reasonably comfortable when I say gradient. Gradient just means the vector that it's the steepest in, right? So for example, we're trying to figure out where the maximum of this function is. We start off here, 
the gradient is the vector that points us in the direction of maximal growth. We take a step in that direction, we reevaluate, and we iterate this, and eventually we'll get to this maximum. Okay? So is everyone aware of this idea? It's just walking uphill is all that's going on. But as it turns out, what it even means to be up a hill requires geometry, which is a little bit odd. So, uh, your next quiz question is suppose we have a function just on our end, so we're ignoring the fact we're on manifolds, we don't want to complicate it too much. If I say df and I say grad f, are they the same, are they different, or what is the difference? Row vector versus column vector, do you know the fancier language for that? Okay. So one is a covector, one is a vector. But yes, one is a column vector and one is a vector. Which one is which? df is a row vector, grad f is a column vector, okay? But in a little bit more sophisticated language, um, they're gonna be called covectors and normal vectors. So df is called a covector and grad f is called a vector. So really what goes on is grad f is just a normal vector. There's nothing weird going on. This is just a vector that is just pointing you in the direction of maximal growth. But df is not a vector, it is a covector, right? So it is a row vector, but this has a, 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 a deeper meaning to it. And what it means is it's actually a function on vectors. Okay, so a covector, so okay, if we think about the differential here, I mean the differential, we choose a vector which is our direction, and our differential at this direction is just gonna be the directional derivative, right? But what we see is df is a function to each vector and then tells you the slope in that direction. So really what a covector is, is a covector is a function on vectors not a vector itself. So when we actually compute, when we actually differentiate a function, the natural thing to get is this covector, right, which is a function on vectors, and we need to find a way to turn this df into grad f. And the recipe for doing this requires Ramanian geometry, okay? I mean, if you don't think too hard and you're just on our end, then yes, the transpose works perfectly, but as we saw earlier, right, the dot product had a transpose in it, but we could spice it up by throwing in this m matrix. So the same thing can occur here. So the way we turn a covector into a vector is we use the Ramanian metric, we use the dot product, we use whatever you want to call it, okay? So what this says is we choose an arbitrary vector v, and so df of v is going to tell us the derivative in this direction, which is going to be a singular number, number. Likewise, you can take the dot product between the vector grad f and the vector v, and this is going to tell you the number that's the dot product between the two and we define grad f to be this magical vector so that this formula holds, okay? So the gradient is the vector that dots with everything that lines up with feeding it into the differential. And as we saw, or as, as it was said about it being row versus column, Right, if the dot product of u v equals u transpose v, right, then we know that df of v equals uh, grad f transpose v, right? And then this equation right here, we're just solving for everything on both sides, it just tells us that df equals grad f transpose. So in the normal sense, in the normal dot product, right, this, the df is just a row vector and the grad f is gonna be a column vector. But of course, we're working on Ramanian things, so this dot product is a hell of a lot more complicated. So this relationship's gonna be a little more complicated too, but the underlying idea is the exact same, okay? So questions about this. The idea is that the transposes of each other, but the transpose is really unpacking the idea of this metric, which is not gonna be just as simple as a transpose. All right, so this leads to what's called the musical isomorphisms. And I always love that they're called the musical isomorphisms. So let V be a vector space, so just think of this as Rn, or think of it as being R3 or R2 or whatever, it's not important. You define it as dual space, and the dual space are all linear functions that spit out a real number. 
So if you think about it, if V are row vectors, V star is gonna be column vectors, because a column vector um, naturally you know, pairs up against a row vector, and then you take, just take their products together, and that's gonna give you a number, okay? So what the inner product or the Riemannian metric or the dot product or whatever you wanna call this thing does, what this does is it finds a way to associate you know, row vector, column vectors and row vectors and row vectors and column vectors by using this idea right here. So you take V for, for the first one, V is gonna be a normal vector. But what you do is you take V, you turn it into a covector by using this isomorphism. And then what's gonna happen when you pair these together, it has to agree with the dot product. And then likewise, sharp is gonna be the inverse of flat, where sharp is you're gonna start off with a covector, sharp's gonna turn it into a vector, so these two, you take their dot product, and that's gonna to correspond to the normal pairing. Right, so this is a really weird way to say it, but this is really just a fancy way to say transpose. But it's a transpose in this more general context. So as we see from this relationship right here, right, you take the differential and then sharp that, and that gives you the gradient. So the sharp and flat is how you flip between these two different things. And we'll see the actual formulas for these on the next ish, on the next slide. Again, they're not as scary as they seem, but they're very abstract and odd the first time you see them. But if you're working on normal dot products and nothing scary, these are just transposes is all that's going on. All right, so let's go back to the, the sphere case. So we have our metric, which is given by this matrix, right? So our dot product, or our inner product, or our Riemannian metric, are they all the same thing as given by this formula where now this thing is this matrix which is allowed to change around, right? In order to compute the sharp and the flat, what we do is, well, we just use this formula right here, right? And it just works out to here, right? Because what happens is U is a vector, but if you wanna pair it with V, you gotta U transpose times M. So this thing now is gonna be given by a row vector, which gives you the actual thing by the metric. And likewise, P is going to be a row vector, and then when you do this big, brouhaha, you're gonna end up with a column vector, which is gonna become a true vector. And if you look at both of these equations and you just let M be the identity matrix, which the identity matrix is gonna give you the usual metric, they just boil down there purely just the transpose of each other. So this is, again, this is just a spicier version of the transpose with this extra matrix added in. But if you just replace this matrix with the identity, it's just transpose. This is just a weird way to say transpose. So questions about these last two lines. So right, in general, if you have your row vector, which is your differential, you gotta multiply it by the inverse of this matrix and then hit transpose. You can't just directly transpose it. So we can do this with the sphere. So let's say um, we have our differential, which is just gonna be the row vector of the two partials, and we wanna turn this into the column vector. Well, you just follow this bottom formula right here, and you get this idea for the gradient now. So in this sense, using this geometry on the sphere, it's no longer the transpose. It's reasonably close to the transpose, right? If you ignore what's happening here, it is the transpose, but this extra turn that pops out is a, is a feature of the metric, which is a feature of the fact that the sphere is not flat, okay? Questions? Okay, so, this is all the required stuff we have to get through, but now you get to go into bonus time. So we've gone through all of this Ramanian geometry, and a lot of this seems kind of like garbledy gook, and we don't really have good reasons for it. I mean, it does tell us how to do gradients for gradient flow, but we haven't really seen much more to that. But it turns out, um, if you've seen Lagrangian mechanics before, it's entirely just this. It's this is completely synonymous with Lagrangian. So to do a quick example, suppose we have a double pendulum and assume that there's no gravity because when you're throwing gravity, things get hard and we don't like things being hard. Things are already hard enough in this class, right? If you do the kinetic energy of the double pendulum, it's precisely this. But if you notice, you can write it this way. You can write it as a quadratic form. You can pull out this matrix in the middle, right? But of course, here we have a matrix in the middle, which varies, so this is a Ramanian metric. So the double pendulum, the kinetic energy for the double pendulum is entirely just a Riemannian metric. So now we can ask the question, right, does the Riemannian geometry have anything to do with this double pendulum? And it turns out they are exactly the same thing, 
by this wonderful theorem, right? If you have a Lagrangian which is just given the dot product of, of a Ramanian metric, then the Euler, the Euler Lagrange equations give you the straight line equations on this curved surface, okay? I'm not gonna explain a proof of that now, but again, if you Google it, you can find the proof. So really all that's going on is if you look at Newton's laws of motion, all that they really say is things go in straight lines. That's all it says. So when you do this for the double pendulum, again, now you're gonna be on some weird metrics or things are gonna be curved weird, but the motion you have of this double pendulum is entirely just going in a straight line in whatever curved space the pendulum thinks it lives in. So this is the entire field of geometric mechanics, which is what I do for a living, is you take mechanical systems, you try to pose it as a geometry question, and then if you know what the straight lines of your geometry are, then you know the path the robot's gonna take because the robot's just moving in a straight line but it's moving in a straight line according to what it thinks is a straight line. So we can do this for the sphere. So if we go back to what the M was for the sphere, this is what the Lagrangian for the sphere metric is gonna be. So there, right, this is the matrix, right? The M equals one, zero, zero, um, one over sine squared. Right, sorry, sine squared. Right, so if you take this as your metric, you're gonna get that for your Lagrangian for the sphere. You jam this into the Euler Lagrange equations and you get these two things. And these two ODEs you get are gonna describe what a straight line on a sphere is. So what is a straight line on a sphere called? That's more general, but yeah, it is a geodesic. Great circle, right? So these are, so first of all, Euler Lagrange equations are called geodesic equations because they give straight lines but in particular, these two ODEs give you great circles on a sphere. So what we can do is we can plot them, right? And this is the same picture of the sphere we had earlier. This is the solution of these two ODEs on the sphere. So these are actual straight lines. So they don't look like straight lines in real life, of course, because, I mean, they don't look flat. But the reason why these don't look straight is because the Earth isn't flat, the Earth is curved. So if you actually put this and glued it on a globe, these would be straight lines on the globe. Okay, so a very nifty thing that you have is if you know what the metric is, you can figure out what the straight lines are just by using the Euler-Lagrange equations. If you haven't seen the Euler-Lagrange equations, don't worry about it, but this is one of the reasons why Ramanian geometry is very wonderful, is you can very easily solve what these things have to be. Okay, and that is it. Are there any questions? And if you want, I can talk a little bit more. There's one more optional thing I want to talk about, but if you're bored with me, you can leave. I don't care. Yeah. To solve the what? So the big point is there's the, the image registration problem. And I guess we can talk about that a little bit because I think Mani is going to talk about that, but that's gonna be later in the semester. This is all, this is all preliminary stuff. And this is why I hate teaching engineers that they always ask why. No, it doesn't. Um, so let's say um, for image registration, we'll do this very quickly. And right, what we have is we have two pictures and we wanna line up the two pictures, okay? So let's say, and when we say pictures, what we have is we have X and Z are point clouds. Okay, and a point cloud is just a, is just a collection of pixels. Okay, so the problem is you give me a collect, two collections of pixels which tell me, you know, a three-dimensional image and I wanna figure out how they overlap a little bit. So right, if you have two pictures of a room and you take, you take a picture of a room, you take a picture of the room over there, you're gonna have two separate point clouds, but if you line them up, you can figure out how you move between taking pictures. So it's good for odometry. Everyone happy with the setup? So what we do is um, we have SE3, and these are the allowable motions. Right, because again, if you, take a cam if you take a picture of the room and then you move and take another picture of the room, the way the camera moved has to be rigid, right? The camera's not gonna disappear in itself or bend. 
So the question is, which H in SE3, so what translation and rotation maximally overlaps X and H times Z? So you take the image Z, you move it by H, and you want to figure out which H gives you the best overlap between these two pictures. And if you can figure that out, then you, you, you've solved the registration problem. Okay? But again, now what we have is we have something on our Lie group. So the way we propose it is we, do, we make some sort of a function, let's call it F, and then we define some kind of like overlap function between X and HZ. Okay, and again, defining what this takes takes, you know, a couple hours to do, but we can define what this is. And Maya is going to teach you this later in the class. Um, but the point is we don't care what this actual thing is. We just care about intuition for why you care about Lie groups. Then what we're going to do is we want to find the maximum So the image registration problem now can be put about as a maximization problem where you want to maximize this function over all of these rotations or all these rotations and translations. Okay? But then going back a whole bunch of slides. Right? The way we're going to find this maximum is we're going to find the maximum by using gradient ascent. So what we're going to do is we want to find the ODE H dot equals grad F. And if we can solve this ODE, then this ODE is going to tell us how to maximally overlap the pictures. But the problem now is this thing, right, is going to lie inside the Lie algebra, and you have to be able to make sense and wrangle with all of this. So the big reason, at least in this class, why this stuff is going to be useful is you're going to use it to build gradient flows for, for these image registration problems. So if you have, ever have anything where you want to find the maximum, the best rotation, the best translation, the best of both, a lot of times you can phrase it like this, and the way you actually solve the problem is you use a gradient flow. And the way you do this gradient flow, right, is again, you got to fix a metric on the Lie algebra to turn, right, df into grad f requires a Lie algebra. You get this equation, and of course, you have to integrate it. Yeah? I have no clue what that means, so no. Yeah, that was mostly him. <laughs> well, so the, so, so the cost function, um, so F takes in a rotation and a translation and gives us back our measure of how overlapped they are. So we want to maximize this. But to maximize it, right, we're going to use this gradient flow, which is differentiating it. And differentiating on this is going to pop us down to the Lie algebra. So to maximize this thing, it's going to require Lie algebra, and it's going to require Ramanian geometry to do this whole procedure. But this is a very long story. And I think if you look on archive, you know, Maya puts like a 30-page paper up or something recently. So you can do it. It's just a, it's a long story. But the tools to answer this is, is today and Monday. Well, what we're doing is we're maximizing their overlap. We define, an, we define a way to measure the overlap between two pictures. And if we maximize their overlap, then we say that, you know, they're best aligned. Yeah, yeah, H is, yeah, H is just a, it's a rotation and a translation. In terms of, say, Euclidean distance, how, how would that make a difference over? How do you define Euclidean distance between two point clouds? Pair them all up? <laughs> well, see, well, see, see th th this feature, it does not require the two clouds to have the same number of points, and it does, not, uh, it does not require us to know the association between them either.
All right, anything else? So I apologize that today and Monday were probably absolutely terrible on your end, but this was just a lot of abstract stuff we had to get through. So just make money, never miss class again, and you'll be fine. Yeah. What my impression is you have to have a good understanding on the orthogonal group and the Euclidean group, particularly in three dimensions, because we live in three dimensions. They're Lie algebras and at least a good intuitive understanding of why grad and D are different and like how to flip between them and like what this matrix is. So, I mean, intuitively you should have an idea kind of everything, but in terms of actually being able to put pen to the paper and do things, it's just the orthogonal group and the special Euclidean group is really the only thing you have to have a good command on. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for this analogy, um, for the double pendulum, there's no potential energy, so no gravity, and there's no controls. So you get a geodesic, so you get these straight lines that there's no potential and no controls. If you add in potential and controls, the answer is almost the same. It just makes it a little bit longer of a story. So you can look up into it. it, it, it the, idea, the, the intuition is similar, it's just a longer story. But you can definitely add controls to it. It just changes what's happening. <laughs>